more to the mind than you could ever find in a book. This is why you, when you meditate, you're often going to run into things that you never read about. Which is why one of the important skills of meditation is, one, to be observant, and two, to use your ingenuity. Because there's no way that the ways of the mind could all be written down and placed between the covers of a book, at least in any book you could carry, any book you could pick up. You would be strong enough to pick up and read. It would be a huge book. And even then, who knows? The fact that the book was so huge would mean it would be useless. This is why the Buddha pared his teachings down to the bare necessary minimum. You know the simile of the forest with the sangsapa leaves or the forest of the samsapa trees. And the Buddha picks up some samsapa leaves, which are about the size of little dimes. had a whole handful of them. He said, which is more, the leaves in my hand or the leaves in the forest? Of course, the monk said, the leaves in the forest are more. The same way the Buddha said, what he awakened to, the knowledge he gained through his awakening, was like the leaves in the forest. And what he taught was the leaves in his hand. Why was that? Because what he taught was necessary for the end of suffering. Or to make another comparison, there's the time when someone asks Ananda for a fire escape. He says, like there's a house on fire, please show me the way to get out of the house. And so Ananda describes eleven ways of focusing the mind, basically the seven of the eight jhanas, and then the four limitless states, or the four immeasurables, and how you use each of those as a basis for gaining insight. And as the man comments, it's like having asked for one exit from a burning house and being told eleven. Notice that Ananda didn't give the whole set of plans for the house, just the way to get out of the house when it's burning. So the Buddha kept his, his teachings compact in this way, because there are a lot of issues he did not address in his teachings, even though the Teachings fill these books up here in the bookcase. There are a lot of t issues he just doesn't touch because they're not useful. And if he were to focus on them, the things that were really useful would get lost. So it's important to realize that as you meditate, you may run into things that are not described in the book. When you think about the forest of John's being out alone in the forest meditating, Think about all the things that came up in their minds as they meditated, and they were miles and miles away from anybody. They had to use their own ingenuity. And it was in learning how to trust the practice, the basic principles of the practice, and then applying them to unusual circumstances. That's when they gained a greater and greater sense of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha as their refuge. The sense of refuge is made really palpable when you're out meditating in a dangerous forest. What have you got? Forest monks have no weapons, and the forests are full of dangers. In Thailand, they don't have that romantic sense of the forest that we do. They're just simply a beautiful place to commune with nature. Because the forest over there seems more aggressive than the forest here. Snakes, wild animals, malaria. And what do you do in a place like that? There's a passage in the canon where there's a monk who's out alone in, the, in a grassland, far away from anyone else, and he's sick. So he asks himself, now that you're out alone in this wilderness, what are you going to do? 
Are you going to go back? He says, no, I'm going to focus on four, four frames of reference, develop the seven factors of awakening, the five strengths, and that's going to be my refuge. When there's no medicine around, when there's no doctor, this is where you look for your refuge and the strength of the mind. So this is why it's important that you put your practice on the edge sometimes, push it more than you might normally like to feel comfortable with. When you get the mind cornered like that, that's when you begin to see its potential for ingenuity. Now sometimes it'll just sit there and suffer until you finally decide, well, enough of this. There must be a way out of this. And the way out is not just getting up and going away. It's looking for what resources you have in the mind. If you're face to face with pain, what can you use? What, these skills you've learned with the breath, these skills you learn with concentration, what can they do to get help alleviate the pain? If they can't make the pain go away, what can they do to at least make your mind not get upset about the pain? How can you use your discernment to figure out where is the awareness and where is the pain and in what way is the awareness separate from the pain so that you don't have to be weighed down by the suffering that the mind adds to the pain? This is where the teachings on the four elements or the four properties are very useful. Learn to look at your body in terms of earth, water, wind, and fire. And on top of that, there are other two other elements as well, space and consciousness. When they're called elements, it sometimes leads to a misunderstanding. They're not talking about the chemical elements. They're talking about elementary sensations or elementary properties. The belief was that you have these potentials in every spot of the body for solidity, warmth, liquidity, and movement, or energy of the, of the breath. They're all there, and they can be provoked. Sometimes they can be provoked in an unfortunate way when a disease comes on. Some diseases are equated with, say, the fire element being provoked or the wind element being provoked. The potential is there, and all of a sudden it gets it gets lit. Or as so John Lee says, it's like taking a, in the old days when you had record players, you're taking the needle of the record player and just putting it down on any spot in the record, you get a sound, because you're focused on that one spot. We can learn how to do the same with your meditation, to counteract any imbalance in the elements. Say the body feels too warm, where is there a cool sensation in the body? Focus on that. Give all your attention to that cool sensation and let everything else go. And then think of it spreading. When you're feeling dizzy and faint, focus on the solidity of the body. Where do you feel solid, solid sensations? heavy sensations. This is useful not only when you're feeling dizzy or lightheaded. I've known people who tend to be manic and depressive. And when you're in a manic state, it's good to focus on the solidity of the body. When you're in a depressive state, it's good to focus on the breath to counterbalance the physical sensations that get provoked by those mental states. on a much more trivial but nevertheless useful level. If you find yourself in a situation where you have an uncontrollable urge to laugh and you know you shouldn't laugh, focus on the solidity down in your stomach, down in your pelvis. Just think earth, earth, earth. In other words, you can use the meditation in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of places. It's not just for the, the transcendent. 
This is John Lee says, when you walk along the path, you find that there are plants that grow along the edge of the path. They are not the path themselves, they are not the goal, but they're, they may be useful. Which plants you can eat, which plants are useful as medicine. And so you have food and medicine to help you along the path. There are lots of stories in the forest tradition about the ways concentration can be used. One very standard one is you've got an issue in your life that you've got to think about. A choice you've got to make. And you have no idea how either choice will turn out. We just sit down and meditate. Pose the question in your mind and put the mind into concentration. Don't deal with the question why you're in concentration. And then see what pops up in the mind as you come out. There's no 100% guarantee that what pops up in your mind is going to be the right solution, but it's got a lot better chance of being the right solution because it's coming from a quiet mind. And then there are stories that are fun to tell, and it's good to know about them. Yom Tam, a student of my teacher, an older woman who meditated, and she came to meditation when she was in her seventies, quite late in life. But she had good, strong powers of concentration, and she happened to meet a John Fuang shortly before he left Vodasokhanam. So she learned the basics of meditation from him, and then he left. And so she had to learn a lot about meditation on her own. And she was a person who tended to have visions in her meditation. And of course, she had to learn how to deal with visions, which ones to trust, which ones not to trust. And she told the story one time about she was meditating in her little hut there at Watasokram, and it was under a cement tree, which is one of these large trees with very shallow roots. And the word was that there was going to, a typhoon coming up from the Gulf of Siam was going to smack into the coast of Thailand, right there at Watasokram. And she was concerned that this huge tree leaning over her hut was going to fall down and squash her. So the question came up in her mind, well, how do these typhoons work? Can you stop a typhoon? So she got into meditation, just posed the question. She got this vision, currents of air running up, running up, running up, and then causing other winds to circle around them. So she said, well, if there's up, upwelling currents of air causing the typhoon, what happens if you cut the currents? And so in her, in her vision, she cut the currents. And sure enough, the actual typhoon disappeared. So I can't promise that you can stop typhoons with your meditation, but it's, it's good to have a sense of the power of concentration, that it many times goes beyond what you would ordinarily think. It really can have an impact on the world. So be alive to that possibility, that your concentration might have uses you would ordinarily not think about. You don't have to worry about the outside weather, but take care of the weather inside your body, the heat and the cold, the solidity and the motion. Learn to look at your sense of the body in those terms and then make use of that understanding. And then you come to realize it's not some awkward pre-modern pseudoscience. It's an actual way of relating to the body that you actually can put to use and gain results from it. This aspect of playing with the elements is not mentioned in the canon. But when you learn how to use it as a meditator, you find that well, it doesn't matter if it's in canon or not, you can get use out of it. You find that you can sit for longer periods of time, and you can push the envelope on that issue of suffering, pain in the body. The Buddha doesn't tell you just to give in to every pain that's there. Sometimes the best way to learn about suffering is to push the envelope, see how far you can get rid of suffering in the body. 
And then when you run up against something you really cannot get rid of, okay, then you then you know for sure you've got something. You're really in a position where you've got to find other needs. Means that require more insight. This is one of the themes of the practice, and we hear all about stress, inconstancy, not self. Not self here, basically coming down to a lack of control over what happens to the aggregates. But notice what happens in concentration practice. You take all these things that are said to be inconstant, and you try to make them as constant as possible. Your perception of the breath, your feeling of comfort that comes from the breath. You take these things that are said to be stressful and you make them as comfortable as possible. These things that are ultimately out of your control and you see how much control you can exert over them. It's only when you flip things around like this. that you get a genuine sense of what the Buddha is talking about when he talks about inconstancy, stress, and not self. Because you push against them. So use your ingenuity in the practice when you come up with issues that you haven't found in the books. Take the basic principles and see what you can do to Apply what you already know. Flip things around a little bit and see what happens. If you take the opposite of what you already know and see, maybe this is what applies here right now. It's only when you test things and push things like this that you really learn. <laughs>